lads a dream, and and it came true, basically. And uh, you know, we're nothing special, normal, you know, everyday kids, all from pretty working class backgrounds. And uh, we just, you know, we had our mindset and we wanted to achieve something, and, and we did. And the five working class girls did make good. The Spice Girls became the most successful girl band ever. Together they sold more and broke more records than any other girl band in history. But on May 31st, 1998, the Spice World dream was shattered when Ginger packed up her platform shoes and walked away. For the first time, we realized that scary Ginger, baby, posh and sporty would not be the forever and that eventually each girl would go their own way. In the past three years, there have been 21 releases and nine number ones from the five Solo Spices. The Solo Spice Girls, who do they think they are? I think once you're in the Spice Girls, no matter what happens after that, you have to measure your success by chart positions. It's more about getting to number one and competing with one another than it is about anything else. First off the Spice block with a solo release is Melanie B with a track she co-wrote with Missy Elliott. The hunk in a harness is Mel's future husband Jimmy Golza. Melanie C's duet with Brian Adams was the first sign that underneath Sporty's tracksuit was a rock chick waiting to get out. When Jerry left the Spice Girl, she declared, I'll be back. Look at me was her mission statement. Although a triumphant PR exercise, girl power didn't win the day as Jerry was kept off number one by Boyzone. This video for Mel B's cover version of the classic cameo track cost millions of pounds, but it wasn't a wise investment for Virgin Records as the track failed to reach the top ten. Michiko Latino, inspired by Jerry's Spanish mother, not only gave the world a glimpse of her now famous new body, but it gave her her first UK number one. But the impact of Jerry's first solo number one was eclipsed by Mel C's hard-edged rock debut. Despite the attention, she fails to match the chart success of Jerry and Mel B's debut. In October, the chart rivalry between the girls got serious. Jerry and Emma released singles on the same day. Emma's debut as guest vocalist on this Tintin Out track was overshadowed by the mother of all chart battles. The merits of Jerry's Lift Me Up single were also overshadowed by the week's revelations that she'd begun dating the other rich ginger personality, Chris Evans. The short-lived relationship ensured that Jerry not only won the tabloid inches, but also the race for number one. The album of the same name also peaked at number four, although it eventually becomes double platinum and remains the best-selling solo Spice album. Bag It Up gives Jerry a hat-trick of number ones and she breaks a record by gaining a total of ten number ones as a female performer. But the triumph is short-lived when she's knocked off number one by Mel C, whose collaboration with Lisa Left Eye Lopez from TLC gains her her first number one. The move from rock to dance proved a chart winner for Melanie C, who gained her second number one, making her the first female to top the charts as a group, a duo and a solo artist. The final spice to go it alone is Victoria Beckham. She guest vocals on a UK garage collaboration with the True Steppers and Dane Bowers. I missed one of the biggest chart battles ever. She's beaten to number one by Spillers I Beat the Nuntham. Having been musically quiet for a while, Mel B returns with a new single and album. Although the single makes a top five, the album peaks at 28. Rumours start the Mel B solo contract is looking shaky. The proceeds from this single are donated to Shelter. Melanie spent last year touring the US and Europe and is working on her next album. Taken from Mel's very autobiographical album, this track told the world exactly what she thought about her ex-husband, Jimmy Golza. Emma is the first Spice Girl to keep the number one slot for more than a week. Now four of the five have achieved number ones as solo artists, a record that surpasses the Beatles. It's raining,
This cover of the Weather Girls disco classic makes Jerry the number one female solo artist in the UK. Melanie B is not enjoying the same success. She is dropped by Virgin as a solo artist and is currently concentrating on presenting and looking for a new deal. Jerry cancels her birthday party when her run of solo number ones is broken. With her next single calling, she is hoping to return to the top. Released this week, Emma will have her fingers crossed on Sunday that she'll get her second number one. The pressure is on for Victoria Beckham. The hype surrounding her debut single release next month is already building. Having been so publicly beaten to number one by Spiller last summer, all eyes are on her to see if she can be the final solo spice to reach number one. I hate the word new look, new image. I think it's all bull crap. When the group were first formed, the image was really, really important. It's something that they worked on with Simon Fuller, their manager, and Annie Lennox actually played quite a large role in influencing them and giving them ideas. They were the girls that could have worked at Quicksave. They were sort of like every gang of girls you see out on a Saturday night in any city in the UK. Kind of like, we're out to pull. You know, they've got proper bottoms, they've got hand, you know, dyed hair and um, wearing the fashion victim shoe of the moment. I do think the more they've sort of moved on from that and they're kind of developing these LA style bodies and being sort of styled for their solo careers, um, I think they are losing that, that wonderful sort of accessibility that they once had. A lot of people think of me as, you know, some miserable short skirt, pout and point. You know, and there's a lot more to me. I think it's very important to her to be seen as leading the way in fashion. You can tell by the way that, you know, her and David are. I love the fact about her that every time she leaves the house, it's kind of like she's putting on a show. She's like an old-fashioned film star in that way. I think Victoria has stayed true to the Posh Spice label. She hasn't, you know, metamorphosized into anything else, really. Her whole life is word past, you know, anything to do with music now. She is posh ink these days. I mean, she had a, a wedding that sort of outglitzed any royal wedding we've seen. She has a, you know, lives in this enormous country pile called Beckingham Palace. And, you know, she says that with a straight face. And she has her own website. And you can cruise through Posh's life on this website. It's interesting now because all the Spice Girls are posh in that they're all hugely wealthy. So they are all posh. So the posh thing doesn't work anymore. I just always wear what I feel comfortable and natural in. Jerry Halliwell has made a conscious effort to move away from you know, the hourglass union Jack Donning woman that we, we knew and loved. Ginger, she's not Ginger anymore. In fact, in Jerry's first video, she had the funeral, didn't she, of Ginger. Ginger was in the flowers. That was a very symbolic moment. And I think what she was saying was, quite deeply, that Ginger was dead. I don't know whether I'm reading too much into that. Suddenly, she re-emerged as this demure creature with sort of straight blonde hair and um, wearing sort of Audrey Hepburn-esque little black dresses and sort of peering shyly out from underneath her eyelashes. But then I think as it evolved, she really did find the right track. And you kind of look at videos like Bag It Up, where she sort of emerged as this sort of mini sex goddess. Um, another one, Machiko Latina, where she's writhing around, you know, on the deck of a boat in a little bikini. And she looked fantastic. Jerry, you should have kind of left it there, you know, press the stop button. That's when you looked amazing. She's, you know, she's changed her image a lot. In fact, she's gone down this frightening skeletal route of just, instead of having food and drink, just having injections, which I'm not sure any doctor would prescribe that. I've never worn a shell suit. I don't know how many times it's been written in the papers, but I have never worn a shell suit, all right? Mel C, I mean, I think she was uncomfortable with the whole manufactured pop band by the end of it. Maybe not to begin with. And she's tried to move away from you know, the sporty spice image, the scouser in tracksuits. 
Um, and she's reinvented herself, I think, in a way that she feels comfortable with her image now. I kind of think that indie rock chick thing was really, really good. I think it really worked for her. She had this sort of short, spiky hair and these tattoos on her arm. And, but she looked great. I'd describe her as, you know, a kind of punk, angst-ridden... Um, Spice Girls reject. There's no way she would make it in an audition for the Spice Girls today, looking how she does, and she doesn't care. I'm still really kind of high street fashion. For me, the only person who's retained what she had in the Spice Girls is Emma. Um, I still think she looks like a Spice Girl. Baby must be... 24, something like that now, so she's no baby anymore. Uh, I think she's accepted that, and you know, she's a woman now. She wears the kind of clothes that you know you could buy at Topshop, you would want to maybe um, recreate Emma's image, and you could do it as well. Uh, and that's important when you're trying to appeal to a younger audience and you're trying to sell your records to teenagers. Um, Girl Next Door is a very powerful image, and it's not to be uh, taken lightly. She kind of cruises along on a different plane to the others in a way and seems untouched by, by anything which I think is really interesting and really hasn't changed a lot from those first days. She's had one hairstyle, I mean always, she's never changed her hairstyle. Mel C has had about 12 or 13 hairstyles, that's been her strength, keep the same hairstyle. Continuity, there's no continuity in the, in the world anymore, and there is with her hair. I mean I'm just playing me but a little bit more common. Mel B, well, she was never scary anyway. It was only ever comparative. So she was probably pretty scared when Virgin called her in and said, we're cancelling your record deal. So Scared Spice might be a better, a better name for her now. Mel B was the fantastic moment in the first solo video where you've got, she kind of ties the blokes up. In fact, her husband-to-be is kind of Jimmy Gulzar who acts as this slave. So no longer is she this cartoon, scary Spice who is, you know, who is kind of, you know, sticking out her tongue and kind of screaming in front of the camera. You know, this is serious adult stuff. Once you get to that level of fame, you're also surrounded by a lot of people saying, you know, you, you, you can make the decisions now. What do you want to do? Where is it you want to go? Because they're... They, they see your, your public profile is so big that it doesn't matter where you, where, you, where you take it. They're still onto a winner to a certain extent. Well, the people I got to work with on my album, even though I didn't collaborate with them vocally, you know, when it came, when it came to co-writing in the music, I got to work with some pretty amazing people like Cisco and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Teddy Riley from Black Street. And I did a song with my boyfriend on there. Um, and I co-wrote Lullaby with the guy who did Wannabe. So I got to work with some really good people that I was really shocked to even said yeah. I'm the M I S S Y to the E, and I got many flows from overseas. Well, how can you beep beep with no keys? Well, Mel B being the first to have a, a solo record out, um, that was in itself historical, and, and it could have been folly, but it was actually a very good choice doing it with Missy Elliott. You know, there's no one more fashionable. I want you back was that's that's my favourite solo Spice single. But it's, was it Missy Elliott or was it Mel B? I mean, I know who I'd put my money on. To kind of pick up on the R&B vibe at that time was a, a clever thing to do, in a sense, but you have to really maintain that level of musical credibility. And there are so many other people out there at the moment doing it and doing it better. She ain't no R&B singer, and that, that's the, that's essentially the problem there. Jerry Halliwell I would describe as pure cabaret. You know what you're getting with Jerry. I mean, it's almost as though you could go to your local butlins and, and kind of see somebody perform in the same genre as Jerry. You left the fire in my eyes, the lightens up the darkest skies. I'm giving up, I'm letting go, I'll find my way. So I think she's the most honest in terms of, you know, she's never tried to do anything other than uh, what, was, what is, it's a pure pop record.
think if you have to award a gold medal for, for trying, it would go to Jerry because she does work so hard. I'm staying true to myself with this album. It's quite poppy. But then I'd like to think it's a bit cooler poppy, you know. Your mind. I wouldn't have picked Dane Bowers to be my uh, me, me partner on my first single. Um, although it made her look good, I suppose, standing next to him. I think maybe... In retrospect, Victoria would admit that there were, yeah, th that it was possibly ill-advised to to try and mark yourself as a credible UK garage artist when you've just emerged from the Spice Girls and this is your first single. I actually did think it was very clever. It was very fitted with the whole kind of when when people like like the idea of UK garage about being a bit of a sort of champagne lifestyle. It was very like it was very flashy. It was very it was yeah, it's perfect. Why not hitch on the bandwagon? Victoria has been quite clever. She sat back and waited and she's tuned into the garage scene, working with some great producers there. She's um, been more calculated, I think, and um, perhaps for confidence. So we're just gonna await her new album which comes out shortly. Yeah, I think making singles generally is a bad idea for Victoria. She should just stick to doing what she does best, which is being photographed and having people around the house. I think my stuff is pop. I was per perfectly honest with you, in the long run, I don't think that Emma stands a hope in hell. I don't, I, don't, I don't think she stands a chance. People often maybe dismiss Emma because she is so middle of the road, but what she's done is you know, quite astute in a sense. She's stayed true to uh, the baby spice image, really. the cleverest, the secret dark horse of the Spice Girls, I think, because she's been very, very patient. She didn't rush out and do stuff. Um, the first thing she did was with a band that no one had ever heard of and will never hear of again, uh, which is very clever, because then she was more famous than all of them, whereas Mel B and Missy Elliott, you know, it was touch and go. With Emma, I think her style is the most true to the Spice Girls. Um, very good radio records. She hasn't released as, as, as many singles as some of them, but they're consistent. I love all different types of music, so I've kind of incorporated a little bit of R&B, um, lots of pop, you know, a bit of dance. So there's lots of things in there. Every Bunton never had the strongest identity within the Spice Girls, so to suddenly stand out and try and recreate herself as a serious musician, I think she would have had a really tough time ahead of her. And in fact, um, her associations with more middle of the road, bland, some might say, artists, have actually benefited her in the long term. I do love rock music. I think. Because you know what, what you grow up with, like listening to your mum's records and stuff, there was always a lot of rock in the house. In the house. I actually think that the, the probably the best records that Mel C did were, were the rock records. I, th I think that Going Down was quite a good record. I think it really suited the... the it suited the way she sang, it suited the way she, she presented herself. She just didn't have the courage of her convictions. It's difficult to come out of a band like the Spice Girls and gain credibility and there's probably a couple of ways you can do it. You, you know, you can, you can market yourself differently or you can align yourself with somebody else who's credible and I think that's, that's how she achieved her success. And her songs are actually, you know, really quite good. Mel C has moved around a bit, rock, pop, trance, um, huge hit with Lisa Left Eye Lopez, great, great single. 
For me, with Mel, she has moments of brilliance, and then she has singles that move away and don't do anything for me. I mean, the trance record, not for me. She doesn't sit well in Ibiza. I turn to you. I don't think any of them should try and be credible because the Spice Girls weren't credible, not in the horrible kind of rock music, beard stroking sense. They weren't credible, they were just brilliant. Um, and all of them could be brilliant if they just stopped trying to be credible. David, he's given me a lot of confidence. I love you. I love you too. Victoria, who maybe arguably is the most famous Spice Girl at the moment, is probably more famous now for her private life and being married to David Beckham than she is for singing. Victoria, I mean, you know, what is there left to be said about that? They are, they are absolutely, they are what Charles and Di could never have been. They're, they are the people's royal couple. The association with David Beckham is really a masterstroke. Um, thank God for them both that it's real love and it works. As far as personal happiness goes, I think Posh seems, she's got it all. The public love Posh and Bex, they're, they're amazing, you know, they're, they're fans to say. The Ali G thing, they're huge fans of Ali G, and David particularly is a huge fan of Ali G. They knew what they were getting into, they watched the videos all the time at home. Does Brooklyn like your music or is he getting a bit old for it now? <laughs> He does like music, he's, he's really, you know, he jigs about and dances and he's also into football as well, so it's nice. So Respect. He's doing a footballer with rhythm. So tell me, is your little boy starting to put old sentences together? He's saying little bits and pieces and yeah. And what about Brooklyn? <laughs> So, do you want him to grow up to be a footballer like his dad or a singer like Mariah Carey? <laughs> To actually have done that interview, I think, turned a lot of people around. It was a very astute thing to do at the time. I think that sometimes celebrities do realise that, you know what, for me to definitely get the photographers after me, then if I'm with another famous person, then, you know, it's, I'm on to a winner. I think Jerry tried to pull one back in that sense by aligning herself with Robbie Williams. Before um, her relationship with Robbie was known, her career might not have continued in the same vein that it was, it was going, but she came back and she's had number one since then. She says, her mum says to her, oh, Ger Geraldine, all you need is a boyfriend. And she says, but mum, I, I, I can't, you know, I don't need a man to fix me, I've got to fix myself. And you are sitting there looking at her and thinking, actually, all you need is a boyfriend. It would be so good for you to have a boyfriend. I'd like to get married someday, but I've got to find the right man. I believe in marriage. But, you know, you've got to love and care for that person and know that you're compatible. I don't think it's something that you should rush into. With Mel B, her love life's always looked a little bit... A little bit scally, to be honest with you. It's always looked a little bit like she she met somebody and she was married to him within, within two weeks, and then then she was pregnant, and it was like it was like every scally from round your way was doing it. Do you know what I mean? You didn't you didn't need a spy skill to be doing it as well. Singing about her marriage breakup and the problems she had with Jimmy Gulls or money grabbing, it kind of leaves a little bit of a sour taste in your mouth because. We don't necessarily want to know the nitty-gritty of somebody's personal life, and it's kind of like assuming that we were that interested in the first place. She did have a very painful, very public breakup from her husband, someone she met on tour, you know, their relationship started on tour, which is quite an artificial situation to be in, so there was going to be pressure, and, um, you know, she's dealt with it and she's come through it um, very, very vocally as well. And the new one... I don't know whether we trust him either. I think Emma and Jade have a really normal relationship and I think Emma would be the first to say that. I don't talk about Jade so much because we are quite a private couple. I think that during her early days of the relationship with Jade, I mean, she wasn't sure how long term it was going to be. She had the normal insecurities everyone does have in an early stage of relationship. The rumours about me getting married were hilarious because it's just, you know, 
me and Jade have been together for a while, but we're still kind of just dating and we're having fun and we don't even talk about that sort of thing. So when we read it in the paper, we were like, it was quite embarrassing. Everybody out there probably knows I'd like to meet someone too. You know, I think that's a missing part of my life. Meet Mr. Wright, meet the father of my children. You out there, stop hiding. I think when you're very famous and you're single, that you're surrounded by so many people who know you according to your famous persona, that it must be hard for you to know when somebody really wants to be with you for you. The subject of whether you're going out with Mel C or being out with Mel C, it's been a national obsession and it's on this programme yeah. as well. So, what's the truth? Myself, I met Melanie the first time at um, the Brits, when we did the Brits. We sort of disappeared and, you know... Where? Back to her place. Oh, and, right. you know, what happened, love? You know, go up to what boys and girls get up to, you know. The way she retells the story, it, it sounds like you, you know, there's a full blown romance there and you see each other all the time and it's. Yeah, because I have to, I, I hold my hands up, I sort of uh, put out a few sort of uh, wrong signals for a while. And then, what, what kind of wrong signals? Well, signal? I was just like, I don't know, I just sort of, I went sort of, I steamed in there and it was a bit full on for a while and I put out the sort of thing that so I was. So now you've backed off? A little bit, yeah. Well, You're messing her around then? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Mel C particularly has found it's been, you know, a hard thing to do to kind of uh, cope with all of that. She has been single a lot the last two or three years. The couple of times that she's, you know, she's had relationships, I think that she's been forced into a situation where she has to make public statements about them. And she's been very, very uncomfortable about that. All right, lads, listen up. Chart battles have taken over the boxing these days. Where you know we follow more closely the um, the rivalry between bands than anything else. What we want is the more to have a big scrap in a playground, isn't it? I, I mean, and this is the closest we'll get. It's seeing them battling it out and somebody kind of fighting back the tears and saying, "Hey, it's okay. I didn't mind. I, I didn't mind anyway." When it comes, you know, to releasing sing singles, you know, another big media thing was the whole Emma and Jerry um, single. And you know what? I mean, it is very nice. It's great to get number ones, but you know, that's not what it's about. The chart battle between Jerry and Emma was significant on lots of different levels. On November 1st, 2000, Emma and Jerry released their singles on the same day. The media turned the chart battle for number one into an all-out war between the Spice Camp and Jerry. I don't think it was an important battle for Emma. I think it might have been an important battle for Jerry, and it's one she certainly didn't want to lose. For Emma, being up against Jerry, I think, was probably unfortunate in that she would have liked people to judge her single on its own merits rather than focusing on a battle with Jerry which in her mind didn't exist. For me, when I bring my music out, as long as my fans enjoy it and as long as, you know, I mean, you know, I get into the charts, I'm, I'm really not a kind of, oh, I'm trying to beat someone, so that's not me. Oh, I think it was incredibly important to Jerry to get that number one, but you've got to ask yourself who the winner was, really, in that scenario, because she did have to spend a night with Chris Evans to do it. There are people out there who are very cynical, who think that she might have done it just no. as a stunt. Oh, do you think? No. Yeah. I know, what, I think, no. Views, please. Oh, oh. I think whatever anybody thinks of it, you just carry on. <laughs> Once you construct this battle, then it, be it means that both of them are going to sell twice the amount of copies that they would have done anyway, because there is a battle. All week it's been very close between Jerry and Emma, but we can confirm that the UK's official number one goes to Jerry Halliwell. She kind of has turned into a war in a way, you know, I mean, when they had their singles out together, her and Emma. She did as much as she could, didn't she? Oh, I know. It was all a big publicity exercise. But isn't that what singles are about? Publicity, I mean... But the thing is, though, I but mean... But if you had a Spice, she... record, a Spice Girls record out and say, boys haven't had a new record out the same week, you'd go for it, wouldn't you? Yeah, but I wouldn't go to the sun dressed as a schoolgirl with my... Unlike me. ...boobs out and talk about <laughs> my relationship. Before, quite recently, I don't think anybody cared about the midweeks and chart positions, but when... Victoria Beckham released her single. We, you know, we were following her progress daily. Posh Spice faces the mother of all battles for top spot on Sunday with the daughter of a former Blue Peter presenter. I think that out of everybody, Victoria really needed that number one single. You know, I got a bit of stick as well for the promotion that I did, but that's just the way I do things. You know, I could have very easily 
done other things to try and get in the newspapers, to try and get profile up around that time, but I didn't. This is the first time we've worked together, so I think we'll be flattered whoever buys the record. Um, and we've had a great time doing it, and as far as we're concerned, it's already been a huge, huge success. We are so happy with the way everything's gone. I sort of feel like saying, if, if you want it that bad, just have it. You know, it actually doesn't mean as much to me as it seems to mean to her. You have to go in number one first week, which is why Victoria Beckham was seen as a huge failure when she was beaten to the number one spot uh, by Sophie Ellis-Bexter. People will always say, oh, she only got a number two with the Two Steppers, but that's a number two, for goodness sake. We sold nearly 200,000 records that week, which is unbelievable. This tune's going to punish you. Poor Victoria, who had this battle with this really kind of vindictive battle, as it turned out, with Spiller last summer, has now got another battle on September the 17th against Kylie. The tabloids love it as well. They, they can't believe their luck that Kylie is releasing the single on the same day as Victoria. They could all just become full-time charity people because they'll always be in the public eye then, which makes them happy, and they'll also have something to fulfil them spiritually. And it won't matter if there's no chart positions then. It's just how's your charity doing? The girls really are role models, and they're in that unique position where they can get a message across. Charities can appear to be the domain of older people. They can seem very worthy and very boring. So for these young beautiful celebrities to kind of march into the charity world with such style as the Spice Girls did is fantastic and it takes charity to a much younger audience. It also took the issue of breast cancer for breakthrough um, into the tabloid press. Um, Jerry demonstrated it very, very early on when she broke from the ranks and threw all her energies into it, being an ambassador. This is my first trip as UN ambassador. There was a touching honesty about the way Jerry Jerry approached her work as a UN ambassador. I think that um, gave great credibility and strength to the uh, impact of her work. Emma Bunton um, took part in the concert that we ran, the With Women concert, in Hyde Park and turned that from a great event into an absolutely fantastic high profile TV programme for us. Each girl has chosen a charity that she actually believes in, rather than a charity that you would think they would go to. With my status, you know, hopefully I'll be able to reach more people with my message and just by simply being a Spice Girl as well. But Black Liners is something I feel very, very strongly about. Did you know that the majority of non-smokers, like for example Melanie C, would rather kiss IR Baboon's butt than a smoker? So there, June 15th is Stamp Out Smoking Day. They're all very sincere and they believe in those charities. And whether we like it or not, the media does run the country. It does. People believe what they read. The Spice Girls have always been a target for bad press and good press, and that's why it's never really bothered us that much. I mean, some stuff is really hurtful when it's about your family or when it's very, very personal stuff. But apart from that, the press really write what they want about us. I think that having your private life played out in the newspapers is very difficult. It was never really bad press for the Spice Girls. They were very lucky and it, quite unusual. So it's not that the press turned on them, it's just that they gave the press loads of reason to turn on them by, you know, by suddenly being five targets instead of one. The press are more important to Jerry than any of the other girls because Jerry wants approval from everyone. Jerry's always been really clever. She's always the one who thought things through. She always was the one who thought, how am I going to make the headline? There's a single coming out, there'll be a documentary, a film piece, something else going on. She knows how to work it. Jerry cries if she's not in the front of the papers every day. You know, Jerry thrives on publicity. I think everybody knows what Jerry does and they know that it is a game, but we still buy into it. I mean, when we saw those pictures of her on holiday in the south of France with Robbie, part of us knew, I think, that those photographs were probably posed, um, but we didn't care. We still bought the newspapers. Jerry still has still has a good amount of newsworthiness left in her. There's still a lot of a lot of mileage to, to come out of her. I mean, it's 
she's another. She's 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 got that kind of car crash element about her too. You, you you're waiting for it to happen. The press are waiting for it to happen, aren't they? It's like the, the higher someone gets, the, the more glorious the fall. It's very cruel. There used to be when in doubt, lead on the royals. Yeah. Now, when in doubt, posh. You taking the piss? No, you're the new queen of newspapers. I've been telling them this Thank for weeks. You. So, so Queen you, Posh and King Dave. I think Victoria makes great copy. I think she loves seeing herself in the press. Um, she's had her fair ups and downs with them, but she certainly enjoys the game. I never think about how the top black tabloids are going to react. I think if you think like that, then you become um, a failure or a victim of your own surroundings and your own fame. I think very much part of Mel's blue personality, way before she even started the Spice Girls, was she said things the way, you know, the way they are. You know, if something's on her mind, she's going she's gonna to talk about it. Naturally, her divorce was on her mind, so she talked about it. I'm sure now, when she realised that the more she said, the more that could be seized upon, I'm sure that she's going to have, you know, some reflection. And, and I think you've noticed, as time's gone on, she's actually said less and less. Touch wood, I don't get as much um, press as the others, but, you know, you just, you just never know. I've, I think I've been really lucky, but I also kind of keep my head down sometimes. And... What really, really hurts is just, what, you know, what's written in the press and when they write really personal things. And Mel C really has had a hard time in the press, but that's because she's had particular difficulties which they've focused upon and exploited. There's been so much focus on her sexuality, on her personal life, on her image, and I don't think it's something that she feels comfortable with. Mel C kind of gives off the impression to me that she enjoyed it whilst it lasted in the Spice Girls. She loved the fame, she loved the adulation. Now she wants to be left alone, thank you very much. Unfortunately, once you've jumped into bed with those lions then to try and excuse yourself by saying actually I ain't playing the game anymore is you know you, you were there you, you did all that stuff to start off with you wanted to sell those records you wanted to be that famous you wanted to be that person you can't suddenly decide now you're bowing out from it there's been less crap in the papers and it's really got me goat so I think that there might be some quite bitter songs to, uh, towards the media in my next album but we'll see. But it's nice thanks, because you inspired me. The Spice Girls live was like going to see a show. It wasn't like going to see a gig. It was like going to the West End to see a big musical, or going to see Cats or something like that, although good. And, you know, they haven't got that on their own. They just need a lot of dancers to back them up, and that's difficult. It's all about being on stage for me. You know, that's the whole reason why I wanted to get into the music industry, because I just wanted to perform, I just wanted to sing, I wanted to sing live. I think the only one who's really managed to cut it live is Mel C, probably, because she's prepared to go out there and play at you know, festivals and places where she probably knows she's not going to get a fantastic response on her own merits. My first ever gig as a solo artist was V99. <laughs> I didn't think about doing it, I'd just done it. And then when I got up there, I thought, because I mean, I was honoured to be on the same bill as, you know, people like Night Street Creatures and Beautiful South, Cooler Shaker, Supergrass. You know, these are my favourite bands, and I was up there with them. So anyway, because I'm a fan of them, I didn't realise that their other fans weren't a fan of me at the time. And hopefully some of them are now. So I got up there, and it was pretty scary, but I like the challenge. Her mum was a club singer, and I think there's an element of, of that in her too. She, you know, she, she loves appearing live, and she doesn't really care that much what people think of the way she looks. I think what she cares about is the fact that her music is taken seriously. Mel B's live performances really uh, take from the kind of American R&B artists. So when she performed at the Nelson Mandela concert, it was very much about dancing. It was about really impressive dance routines and some of the moves were really breathtaking. Oh, yeah. be was an embarrassment at the uh, Nelson Mandela gig I think they should be very careful with their live stuff and only really do it when they're absolutely ready and they've decided what they want to be Miss Jerry, Jerry 
wants to put on the most over the top, most spectacular, most, you know, look at me show possible. When Jerry appeared um, on the same bill as the Spice Girls, she actually stole the show, and it was her that you know you, you saw the next day in the newspapers. What Jerry knows is that maybe she isn't a live singer, she isn't a fantastic musician, but she knows how to pull the punches, and she knows that basically, if you wear a skimpy enough outfit and surround yourself with maybe some kind of mad lesbian-looking dancers, you, you, you basically you're going to get in the papers the next day. wait to tour and um, I think one of my goals would have to be um, playing at Wembley on my own just be fantastic Emma Bunton's been quite clever and Victoria Beckham as well appearing at things like Party in the Park where you know it's a pure pop event After her performance at Party in the Park, newspaper headlines were screaming the next day about how she didn't sing live and what a travesty that really was. When I mime, I mean, with the True Steppers, the dance routines that I were doing were so difficult that there's no way you could have sung live with it. You don't get Britney Spears singing live. Michael Jackson hardly ever sings live. Um, but I will always get criticised for that. These days, pop stars prove themselves in front of a video camera rather than they do on a live stage in front of 12,000 people in some big arena. I'm sure the expression, doing a robbery, has been banded around at every single member of the Spice Girls as they have left the band in whatever management or record company meetings they've had. Everyone has said at some point or another, you're going to do a robbery. They all want that success. And if you look back with Take That, the money was not on Robbie Williams. It was on Gary Barlow. And when I worked with Take That, Gary Barlow was always being groomed to be the most successful. Now, he will be in his own right as a producer. But as a performer, Robbie took it, but it took one record. And Angels is Robbie's benchmark, and everything else is measured against that. Any Spice Girl who has a hit like that will then be catapulted up and they've all got that ability, we just have to wait and see which one it is. Unlike with Take That, every one of them has had, you know, an element of success on their own terms. There isn't really one person who's emerged like Robbie Williams who you could say, right, obviously that was the, that was the talent in the band. Um, you know, where are, where's Gary now, where's Mark Owen? You know, Take That. Only one person has managed it. We thought two, there was a time when it could have even been three, but no, it's only one, and that's obviously the, the running total. Now, if any of the Spice Girls managed to survive for more than two years, other than Jerry, then they'll have disproved um, one law of pop science. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are the Spice Girls. Maybe you've heard of us. The way people's careers now work with television, it's so close, the synergy there, that it's just a natural progression that they're going to then present. Being a TV presenter seems to be the thing that everybody wants to be now. So it's not become a TV presenter, and if you're lucky, then you could have a single out and become a pop star. Become a pop star, and that's just a stepping stone along the way to having your own programme on television, which is very strange. It's all upside down. They've lived their careers back to front. They've started with... A total fireworks, there's been absolute incredible celebrity, there's been fans doorstepping them, there's been people screaming and shouting, and this is right across the world. They've been A-list celebrities, and now they're TV presenters. I would say it's a come down from being an international pop star and icon to being the presenter of This Is My Moment. Well, it's a mixture of stars in their eyes meets who wants to be a millionaire but without the tack. 
and it's prime time Saturday night, which would be wicked. Welcome back to This Is My Moment. Now, everybody here dialed 0906 200 2000 and auditioned for the show by singing down the phone. Now, we had over 30,000 calls and only 50 were selected. And from that 50, we're going to choose five. I mean, we've seen this kind of TV show so many times. What it needs is a real personality to lift it and make it unique. And she is that personality. What is her role now? It's sort of a... She's kind of the funky Jane MacDonald. She's fine at that, but... I, I don't think in her, in her scheme of things, that would have been where she'd penciled herself, where she would have liked to have been at this point. Good morning and welcome to see the UK live from London. And look who's joined us this week, it's Emma Bundan. Hello. 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 Who's on this week's show, Em? Oh, do you know what? We've got loads. We've got performances from Ricky Martin, David Gray, Robbie Williams, and an exclusive interview with you two in New York. I love presenting, and I had great... About two weeks ago, I presented with Anton Deck, and we had the best laugh, and, and they've asked me to come down again and join them. So, you know, I love doing it. It feels very natural, and I, and I feel very comfortable with presenting, so... She's no longer in the, the category of a Britney Spears. She's now in the category of... A cat daily. I think Victoria was was quite successful in her interview programme in that it was a one-off. It was really more about her than it was who she was interviewing. Oh, Can it be dear. really nice to me because this is the only yeah. interview I have ever done and I'm Come really on. nervous. I've been bad enough to your old man for all these years, I'll be nice well, to you. No, because I actually, I was talking to David last night and I wanted obviously to know a bit more about you and like what you've done and all that kind of thing. And he actually said that he thinks you're a bit of a puff on the pitch in actual fact. Did he? he? That, and it was about her kind of turning a whole fame thing on its head um, and knowing how to use it, that's a much more clever and astute way of, of using your success as a Spice Girl in another area. Jerry has a tendency to go for the kind of bleeding hearts causes um, and perhaps getting her fingers burnt a little bit. It's so frightening that this is what the world has come to, that people live on rubbish dumps. It just puts us all to shame, really, doesn't it? The Walkabout documentary, I think she wanted to give something back, as a lot of celebrities do. And I think she wanted to see herself in a different light. So all the other Spaces have made TV shows. <laughs> and this is mine. They know exactly what they want in life. And um, they're nobody's fools. I don't think we should underestimate them. I think it's really going to be a battle of the two um, greats, Jerry versus Victoria. Well, who does want to be Jason Orange? at the end of the day. I think their individual careers is very much about proving to themselves that they can exist without the other girls. To critics, and maybe to a certain extent themselves, there's a lot to prove. They absolutely need fame, like other people need oxygen. So, um, sadly, it's like an addiction, and that's what they always wanted. They've got it, and they need to keep it now. That's the hard part. Well, don't go for lookalikes, go for the real comedy with friends tonight at 9 and followed by Will and Grace at 9.30.